let's just kind of open it up to Q and A. Anybody got any specific issues or whatever before we before we talk about uh, El Capitan that maybe Steve and I can address for you? Great, that's it. Everybody's having no problems. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> These new operating systems. All I've read about is panning photo. They don't give us back eye photo. Eye photo. So if I if I go to Yosemite or even El Capitan, yeah. how do I how do I import eye photo into the new uh, OS? It's automatic. You don't have to. It's eye photo was there. Oh, if you've got if you've got the new photos app, it reads the eye photo library. It builds a separate XML file which has nothing to do with the images itself. So there's no conversion of the photos or nothing like that. You can use them back and forth if you want to. Well, just be, uh, but I've been told the tools aren't quite there. Though they're, it, it's not exactly the same. It's just like when they upgraded to Final Cut Pro and when they made the first changes, yeah. to when they made the second major, major update to iMovie, it doesn't work the same way. Here's photos right now. Um, I've sort of gotten used to it. I like it better. There's a few things I wish I could change on it. But um, it was announced a couple of days back on the uh, that, um, and I'll be talking about that. The new photos, when it comes out with, um, and I imagine the, the version that, that's currently working on uh, Yosemite will probably be the same thing. But when uh, El Capitan gets released, there's going to be a photos update that will allow third-party plugins, like iMove, uh, excuse me, like like iPhoto had some. And there, there's no definitive answer yet as to whether or not you'll be able to open in an external editor directly into like uh, Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever it is. But the assumption in the community seems to be they'll probably add that feature back in there as well. They probably haven't gotten commitments from Adobe and from the other third-party vendors uh, whether they're going to allow them to use those, uh, those handshakes back and forth between them. So currently, the, the current Photos version right now that we have available to us does not support third-party apps like filters and things like that, not yet, and it doesn't support um, external editors directly. You have to export the file to the desktop or wherever you're going to put it, open it up in your editor, and then re-import it back in. Hopefully that will change. The, at least the third-party add-ins definitely will change. That's already been announced multiple locations. Did that answer your question at all? Sort of in a roundabout <laughs> way. Sorry about yeah, that. The other thing you can do is you can have uh, a second computer set up with everything the way you like it. Use one computer just for that so things get straightened out. And then, uh, I mean, that's what I would do. Well, and you can also run photo, uh, photos and iPhoto side by side. It's not, not a problem. You can do that if you like. If you want the photos capability, but you but you like the way iPhotos work, you can have them both on there because it's a totally different name. So when you download photos, it's a different name. It's not iPhoto. So it's not overwriting the existing copy. I mean, even when they did that to iMovie, I like I have a lot of projects that I had done in, in the old iMovie. In the new iMovie, I still st there there's a lot of capability that it's got. It's a lot better, but it's still I still remember the old way I did it for five years or whatever. So I renamed the existing iMovie to whatever it was, iMovie 9 or 10 or 11 or whatever it was. And when I added in the new iMovie, now there's two separate files. There's iMovie 11 and there's iMovie. iMovie being the current one, iMovie 11 being the older version if I, so I didn't have to convert a project over if I needed to go back and work on it. So at the moment they, they, could, they can coexist. So if you were to run photos and iPhotos side by side, would you then have two separate libraries? No, same library. Same it library. uses the okay. same library, it builds a secondary file, like like where it keeps its searches and albums and all that kind of stuff, it will do that. But the, but they but it's the same photos. You don't have to import the photos. It just you just point it to wherever your library is at. If it's not there, if it's not in the photos area of your home directory by default. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. That, that so I mean, I, I I'm slowly getting used to the new photos. Um, I like the fact that um, the current iCloud has the option now that you could. I've got my iCloud. Besides the 5 gig, and I had it for the 20 gig for a long time, but my photos that I've got in here so far about 28 gig. So I went ahead and opted for the 200 gig option that um, Apple offers because it's not that they're definitely not cheaper than third parties out there, but it's 
seamlessly integrated for the most part. So I like the way, those of you who haven't tried this, I like the way iOS 8 and Yosemite and Photos all work together in that on my iPhone here, I can, and this is a 128 gig iPhone, so I mean it has plenty of room, um, I can choose to have full res photos kept on the iPhone or I can have them optimized for the iPhone. And the, in, and the same thing on your Mac. If you've got, if you've bought the extra storage at iCloud, or you're under five gigs, you don't have to do that. If you've bought the extra storage at iCloud, my versions of my photos that so far are in the photos library here on my Mac are full res versions up there. You know, they're roughly 10, uh, 10 gigabyte a piece or whatever the hell they are, something like that, whatever they, not 10, gig, 10 megabyte a piece or whatever they are. My scan slides are around 24, 25 megabyte a piece. Sending to iCloud. So the full version's on iCloud, and I, at the moment I'm keeping a full version of them here on the Mac, but I don't have to. I can keep a resolution dependent wise here on the Mac, and the same thing on the iPhone. And the interesting thing is, if I want to edit one of those files and I don't have the full res version available, iCloud just downloads the full res version for me to use right now. And I can make whatever changes I want on either device. I'll talk the iPhone and the iPad because I don't have the I don't normally keep the full versions on them. Make whatever changes I want, and when I quit, that high res version stays on the iPhone for the time being, and it updates the it updates the version that's sitting up there in the cloud, which means it'll also update the version the next time I open up photos on the Mac or on my iPad, it'll update those as well. Still with whatever settings I've got, whether they're optimized or full, either way. And then at some point in time, as space becomes more critical on the iPhone, it'll revert back to a optimized version for the iPhone because the full version is sitting up in the cloud. That's a little hard to get your head around, but it really does work. So it's kind of nice that you can have, I could have, uh, you know, a terabyte where the photos on here in the optimized version might only be 10 or 15 gig. And how many times am I going to edit a photo on the iPhone as opposed to the iPad or the Mac? But, but it's there if I want to do something with it. And you just see it when it opens up. You can see the little wheel as it's downloading the file to give you the full version to be able to work with when you want to actually do some work on it. So I think they've handled that pretty well for the most part. Yes, sir? Have you ever heard anything about um, Word 2016 for Mac that's not a subscription? No. As far as I know, Microsoft's going to make that a subscription. Go ahead. If you wait until September, they say they will offer um, a standalone purchase or upgrade. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for September. I can't find it. You know, it's supposed to be about the same price, eight hundred and thirty something dollars for a single license. Well, I've still got what is it, uh, Word 2004? That's up. That's had the little incremental updates to be able to make it compatible and read the the current version of the database. And I assume. Microsoft will probably offer some kind of an option to be able to read the 2015 or 2016 version with it if there's any, if there's any, if there probably isn't even a, a change to the data, I don't think. Um, but I use Word so seldom now that if I was going to do anything new, uh, it would be convenient because I've had Word for 20 years or whatever. Um, I, 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 I'd force myself to try to use, see if I could do it in pages, probably. Just because of that's being supported across all the platforms, so. Right. There will be a standalone well, that's good to know. I mean, uh, you know, Adobe's pretty much gotten rid of that when it comes to their applications. Is it worth it? I think it is. I mean, you you have a couple of options. Whenever Adobe did an upgrade, let's let's pick Photoshop. When they went from Photoshop 7 to Photoshop 8, it was a $199 upgrade. The program itself was $600. So, gee, 200 sounds pretty good compared to six. But I always got a little miffed at Adobe that if I had version 7 and was upgrading to 8, I paid the same price as the guy that had version 4 and was upgrading to 8. That always kind of bugged me a little bit. It's like there should have been a, a, a loyalty di discount. That's me. There should have been a loyalty discount for the, for the dummy that was buying every version. So I had finally gotten to the point that unless, whenever I saw a new version of Photoshop come out, because I was always paying out of my own pocket, I kind of looked at what new features I got with it versus what I had right now. And if I could skip a version, I did. If, the, if, if I wasn't going to be taking advantage of those new features, I'd skip a version because the old one worked fine, did what I wanted it to do. 
So I would go from like five to seven to nine to 11, that kind of a deal, and save myself, what, 200 bucks in between. The current deal that, it, so look at it this way, it's 200 bucks a year if you wanted to maintain the current version of Photoshop. But I was also an avid Illustrator user, have been since version one days. I, a, a, a very strong InDesign user, because I was a PageMaker user, and when they got rid of PageMaker, I went with InDesign, so I've been current with InDesign. And I'm playing a little bit with Dreamweaver, not seriously, but I'm playing a little bit with that. I, I had learned Flash, which we all know, that's pretty much history. So the problem was every time a new version of anything came out from Adobe, the magical price was $1.99 for an upgrade. So in a given year, it's conceivable they would upgrade Illustrator, Photoshop, and InDesign, the three that I use most of the time. That was $600 worth of upgrades per year. If I skipped every other year, it was $300. That's the way I looked at it. Their current plan, if you sign up for Creative Cloud, the full Creative Cloud subscription, is $30 a month or $360 a year for every piece of software that Adobe makes. That's cheaper than two updates. So I looked at it, I looked at 30 bucks a month. My wife is paying 50 or $60 a month to get both the register and the times. You tell me why, I have no idea. So I figured 30 bucks a month was pretty cheap for me to maintain, to have the latest version of anything that Adobe offers. And if, I, if I'm running short of space, I don't hesitate to trash a couple of Adobe files that I don't need right away because guess what? I can download them again anytime I want to, and I don't have to worry about it. It's all maintained in Adobe's so-called cloud environment. Now, that's one option for Creative Cloud if you have need for those other tools. But as you all know, Aperture has been, has been anybody who was using Aperture, and I only played with it. I've owned it for, for four years. I was only just playing with it. So Aperture officially is not on the Apple upgrade policy. It will work with El Capitan. A Apple has no intention of getting rid of it, but, what, but they're not going to do any kind of updates to it either. They obviously just didn't make it, sell enough of it to make it worthwhile, especially since uh, Adobe's Lightroom is, is so far ahead of it. So I look at it from the standpoint that, okay, the one I really want to use for when I'm doing digital photography is either, I'm either going to use photos if it's quick and dirty, or maybe I'd use Lightroom if I want to do something for my, from the, I haven't done any serious uh, image competition for a couple of years, but if I want to get back into that, I probably will someday. Or if I really want to, you know, do some blemish retouching or something like that on a photo, I would use Photoshop because that's what I'm used to using. You can get Photoshop and Lightroom, the two most popular image editing programs around, for a subscription price of $10 a month. So for $120 a year, that gives you a current version of Photoshop and a current version of Lightroom that you have available to you all the time. Less than one normal Adobe upgrade price. So now it starts to become kind of realistic. If I find myself in another year or two not really using Illustrator and, and um, InDesign, which I haven't hardly done anything with it this last year, I'll drop my $30 a month subscription back down to $10 a month just to maintain those two because those are the two I'm really going to use seriously. So I look at the subscription price as, uh, yeah, it's nice to own it. Do you own it? No. You have the right to use it. That's what that law, that's the way that really reads. It's basically, uh, you're renting. You're renting the software. That's exactly what it is. I mean, I, 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 I work at Broadcom, and I install software tools, design tools, for the users. And somebody the other day said, we'd like to get another 10 licenses of this software. Holy mackerel, it's $3,600 a license per month. And, and they have to buy it in three month increments, and he wants ten licenses. So that's going to be thirty six. That's going to be roughly a hundred grand for 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 his group to have. You know, his his group will get exclusive rights to those ten licenses. They won't make it available to the other Broadcom people because it's going to come out of their budget rather than out of the Broadcom generic budget. I'm glad I'm not the finance guy that has to figure this crap out. So we have to we have to install the licenses. As a, on a separate license server and make it unique just to these eight or ten individuals that he's got. And it will look th for the licenses for him there before it goes out and looks everywhere else. And if they're willing to pick it up out of their budget, what do I care? I'm just, all I do is just do the installs. So, I mean, you know, gee, 10, or 10 to $30 a month looks real cheap for one guy, you know. So I think the subscription model is a good way to go. If you were using Word and Excel, 
and PowerPoint and a lot, the subscription thing makes a lot of sense to me. But if you're doing it as an individual, if I was starting out the day scratch, brand new, and I was looking for a word processor and didn't want to go with the, the now free pages and numbers, I'd get one of the clones that's out there. I'd get Star Office or Neo Office or Open Office. Open Office, they're all free and they do probably 98% of what Microsoft's stuff does for free. I just wouldn't spend the money for anything that I don't absolutely really think I need. Not that important. Get another name. Probably an ad. Um, does, does that help out anybody? Does that make any sense what I said there? Yeah. I think that's, if, if you need something now, I'd be tempted to go with one of the free ones. Or Pages, because Pages is free for all practical purposes now. Well, one of the issues for me is if I make a spreadsheet or a Word document and then send it to someone else, that they can then view it in the format that I sent it in. What are those uh, um, ones that you spoke about? How are they? In the case I of open, in the case of uh, well. yeah, in the case of Open Office or Star Office, they're 100 percent compatible with Excel. In the case of like Numbers. Numbers has its own format. It can open and read Excel files, but apparently for Apple to get the rights to write in a num in a Excel compatible 100% compatible format, they were going to have to license that from Microsoft. So instead, they save it as a common delimited file, a, a text file basically, and then it's, you convert it back over. So going from Excel to numbers or going from Excel to almost anybody's spreadsheet. If it doesn't open it directly, it has to be saved as one of those CS, as a CS, comma separated value, a CSV type file. Um, in the case of Open Office, and I think it's true of Star Office, I'm not sure about Neo because I haven't used it for such a long time, they open and save in all, the, in all those uh, formats that Excel does. Because basically they're people that got screwed over by Microsoft and this is their way of getting even. So not, that's the unofficial answer, but. Go ahead, Stuart. I'm looking at um, numbers right now, and on in numbers you can export it to PDF, Excel, CSV, or numbers. Uh, to Excel? Yeah. Because the last time the la I haven't done any for a while. The last time I tried it, I'm yeah. gonna find out real quick. It didn't do that. It only saved. It only out went as a uh, CSV or TXT file. <laughs> Great. Don't have anything current. All right. So let's make one up. Yeah. I'll be down. That's new. Yeah. So that's 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 changed. Um, that's changed. Uh, <coughs> Shows you how often I've used numbers. Look at that. There's Microsoft's current current most recent format is there's XLS and the X means extended version. And also you do it in Good for them. So somewhere along the line they've negotiated something with somebody. That money talks, doesn't it? It's not like the world's most most profitable company can't can't afford to do something like that. So cool, there's your answer. Do you have numbers already? No. What version of the operating system are you running? I can't remember when they started making it free. I'm going to assume get a new one. So. You are, okay. Because, yeah, right. Definitely definitely uh, Yosemite and uh, Mountain Lion and Mavericks. I'm, I'm not sure about Ma uh, Mountain Lion. But definitely Mavericks and Yosemite and, of course, El Capitan. Pages, Numbers, and Keynote are freebies. How about Keynote and um, PowerPoint? Yeah, Keynote has the ability to save in a PowerPoint format. But here's the drawback. Uh, PowerPoint doesn't support every feature that Keynote has. That's right. Well, so you might do something in Keynote, excuse me, in Keynote, like an animation or whatever it is, that doesn't exist in PowerPoint. When you export it, uh, Keynote's bright enough to say, save it as a quick time movie, and that's the way it's going to integrate it. But it won't have all the functionality, but it'll have probably 99% of it. Can you make 
volcano yep. open straight away? Yep. GPS? Yep. Now, if you got them both on here, by default, it's going to open up the PowerPoint. But you can always do a right command, open with, or or go back and you know go into get info and say always open with this program. You always have that ability. You know what talking about? Yeah. Does everybody know what I mentioned by that? If you've got, like as an example, my default, I'm going to quit this. No, I don't want to save this junk. So as an example, let's let me go find something that is a taste tasteless to look at. Not that I ever have that. Okay, there's a good example. If I double click this medical XLS file, it's probably something for the tax guy and I haven't bothered to format it. Yep, that's exactly what it is. So in this case, it opened the numbers because I already changed it over. But I have the option, if I do a right mouse click, see it's going to default to, it would normally default to Microsoft Excel because it recognizes XLS as their default format. But I can also say open it in Bento or open it in Numbers or open it with with a preview, and, it, and Apple will do the conversion on the on the on the hand. If I want to make this a regular thing to open in one particular format, I can do a get info on that particular file, and look at right here in this column right here. It says, see, it's already been changed. I've already changed my XLS file to open in Numbers. But if I want this to always open in Microsoft Excel, the default, I can just leave it like that, and the next time I open that file. It opens up in Excel. And uh, before I ask you to, to tell me, but I also have the option, because maybe it's only onesie twosie files that I really want to do that with. If you notice, there's an option here to change all. Well, that will go out and find that XLS format, because that's what I've got selected, and will tell every XLS file there open in numbers. There's one little thing I don't know if everybody knows is um, create cl a uh, close out window, please, and highlight the medical. Now, when you take and you do a right click or a um, uh, control, control uh, yeah, it gives you all the short of uh, the uh, contextual menus, and there's one there that says quick look. Basically, if you want to look at it, um, there now. It's not open in the application itself. It's just a quick look. It's actually open in a variation of preview is what it is. Yeah. But no. it's not called preview. Now, I didn't even have to do that. It's like Steve was saying, if I just highlight that file and hit the space bar. That's what I was just trying yeah, to do. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think you took your thunder, Steve. Sorry about that. You're too late. <laughs> hey, don't stutter around. <laughs> also, if you, instead of, when you right click, you Open with if you option right click and it says all with. You are what? If you option right click, it will change open with to always open with. And I'm pretty confident. Oh, see? I always forget the option key does a lot of little hidden it's stunts. I always forget about they, that. They don't tell us Look at it's also changing slideshow. So yeah, like a slideshow of Excel information. But if I had multiple page, if I had multiple pages, uh, that's kind of kind of handy. Well, where that really came in handy is when you've got something like, you know, like one of these. I mean, I hit the space bar and I can see what that. What the hell is that screen snapshot? But I didn't give it a better name. You know, it's got the the date and time. It's better than the old days where you used to call it screenshot one, two, three, four. You know, at least now it time stamps it. But the smart thing for me to do right now would be to rename that file to a uh, receipt for Cult of Mac, whatever the hell it is I bought. Yeah, that's the thing. Is my wife said to me, you've got a thousand files on your desk. <laughs> I've never made a comment to him about that. Uh, yes, you have. And uh, I embarrassed myself one day. I connected to it and put it up on the projector, connected to my home computer. Um, the thing is, is what Greg was saying is, as soon as you can, get that thing renamed, because the thing is, you'll look at it and it's like, what the heck, you know, is this thing? And at the most inopportune time, you're going to want to know what they are, what it is. So um, Here's one nice feature about preview. You saw how dumb I was there. I haven't bothered to rename those snapshots. 
obviously I felt they were important, so I hung on to them. But I've opened, I've opened up, uh, see it opens up a PDF as well. So let's say I pick that first snapshot and I open it up. Well, I don't want to have to close that and manually open the next one. You can use the up-down keys. Yes. Is that handy? Yeah, it's, it's really uh, great for that. Yeah, it's probably out. It's, the time going. February 18th? Yeah, I'm a little slow. I haven't gotten around to getting rid of those. <laughs> I never, I try not to print anything. In fact, I probably haven't used the printer in a year. Um, I almost always save a screen snapshot of everything or print to PDF or whatever. And more and more of these, like as an example, if I went to Boston Market, if I put that as a picture inside my phone, more and more of these places, if you just show them the phone, they'll accept that as a, rather than a piece of paper. Not always. Sometimes I have to have those to get, to get reimbursed. Yeah, Corky. Well, I guess one thing that's come I noticed that you document what I've been doing for years and then file names. You've got it year, month, day. No, that's what Apple chooses. Oh, really? Yeah, it's fantastic. I don't file stuff that way because I started 30 years ago filing it a different way. Well, the way the standard with the year at the end is the way I learned it as well. When I was and that's fine. That's the way we all think. Well, that's a that's a personal choice, isn't it? Well, but then anything you've got where you have the date in it, you don't have to have a special date column. Any ordinary um, uh, math column will work. It's going to start in the right sequence. It doesn't take any special. It's going to work at a glance. Boom. That works for you. In fact, in me, in my right case, there. in the case of that first one up there, uh, I would call it 13, 13, 12, 21. Exactly. You don't need the two zero from hundred years before that to go to twenty one. No, I realize that. So just use the That's way the way Apple does it. Those are ah. those are the screenshots from Apple. And by the way, there are utilities out there like Tinker Tool that will let you go customize how that comes out if you want to. They must have listened to you, Corky. That must have, <laughs> I'm sure you were the one they listened to. They must have, yeah. It makes so much sense. But I don't I don't put stuff that way. I put day, month, year. So normally mine would be 21, 12, 13. Because that's the way I've been doing it since my Unix days, 40 years ago or whatever. And I wanted it in the six digits, and I wanted to be able to sort it based on that. So that's why, you know, before you had all these other options, that's the way I got in the habit of doing it. So. Mm. And what countries in the world do it that way? You know what? That's why computers allow us to do whatever we want. Yeah. Yeah. That's the advantage to that. Oh. Uh, like, uh, I send a thing into Apple, and I'm, I'm waiting for, will you, did you download 9 for iOS? No, I was going to, yeah. and and um, I was going to put it on my iPad, and I just ran it. Because, uh, I, I figured, that we ha next month we have Allison Sherry going to come out and talk about her password management procedures, uh -huh. and um, we'll probably do an iOS 9. Yeah, because the thing was, in. I, myself and a couple of other people, um, have run into this quote problem is every time you're putting in numbers, I give you a keypad, the or or um, on the keyboard, you know, like you're sending a text message or something, and it comes up, your uh, backspace or delete is always right there on it the right side. It is warm and stuffy in here, isn't it? And we need, to get, we need to make it a little cooler. All you got to do is just let me know. Um, and so People on. passing out don't work? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> um, okay. Now you got me. Now I forgot what I was going. Where is it right now? 70. As long as he's doing that, I'll just quick comment. I notice you got uh, AM or PM on time. You can just go to 24 hour time, you have to worry about that AM or PM over there. That's fine, but I don't think that way. <laughs> For instance, on your cell phones, you're setting the alarm. No, I don't have it set. I don't show it that way on my cell phone. Hey, you know, you're lucky it doesn't show bells, the nautical term. I don't happen to like, I like AM, PM. Yeah, I don't like that. 
and having to figure out. No, I don't have a problem with that. I don't. I mean, obviously, a, it's easy. I got to subtract. I got to subtract. I don't have a problem with that because I'm dealing with at work. I'm dealing with worldwide. I've got machines located in 32 different physical locations around the world. Oh my and we're dealing with the date time stamps on them all the time. Oh, well, that means you get a and all those times that they don't. Yeah, whatever. It doesn't that doesn't bother me. So I don't let it. You know what GMT is, right? Greenwich Mean Time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Universal yeah. Coordinated Time. Yeah. So, so. yes. I I changed from Pages in the, in the numbers. How do I change back the numbers to pages? I can't seem to do it. You're, so, talk, you're talking about a single file you've got that way that you want to put back? Mm -hmm. When you, so you I, went. I have a long list of number, or names. Okay. Now I have them in two columns in pages. Okay. And As text. I mean, you, can, you can select them individually, right? Yes. Okay. And each column consists of a first part and a second part. And I can change it over to numbers and I can alphabetize it. I got it over there and alphabetized, and now I can't get it back. Can't you do uh, uh, import export? So I can try it. Okay. Greg's going to try it for you. I didn't put a space there, that's why I didn't get carried. Yeah. They're individual, so you can edit it, but it thinks, but it uh, brings over by default with the cell format. It's probably a way of getting around that. Okay, I'll put it on the list and see if somebody But at least they are individual, so you still can go back over here and uh, change them. So it's editable text, but it's, but it thinks it's still an Excel document, uh, uh, Excel data inside of a Pages document. They put it that way. Putting it on the list. How many people? are still having problems sending any uh, questions to the list and not seeing it come back to you. Not from not from everybody else, but if you're sending something to the list, you're on that list. So you should get immediately or pretty soon a return copy of that email uh, to you. And I've had people say they're not getting it and they're not getting answered. And we've had a problem for probably since last year um, where our server has been blocked on a certain company, um, uh, what do you call it? Verizon. Verizon, there's AOL. I've had, you know, I'm trying to make you know, if, if people could take and create a, um, and and this is basically they don't want people sending stuff from anything more than an individual. So like say for instance, Greg puts out an announcement. It may not get to everybody. So I went through the membership list and um, selected all the people that had Verizon website. And they may not get it through there, but they may get it if I send it direct to them. So these companies, um, uh, Yahoo, okay, they take and they block it if it doesn't come from the actual sender. And that's caused us ungodly trouble. And the, uh, I really think that it, it sh everything should work. But I've asked that people try and get a, um, what do you call that, the uh, iCloud. You know, use, try 
try using your uh, beginning uh, name you know, before the before the at sign and get an iCloud account with that as your um, as your email, and then that way when you set it up as an email account and email, it will then everything that comes from OACC will go right there because. Um, they don't have the same restriction at Apple. Yeah. But nobody here is the people that uh, didn't get it? I got two actually. Two, 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 uh, same stuff, um, well, Greg, like you, the Stuart, you're probably still on the possibles list. I'll go back and check that. Actually, Whenever somebody says, I want to be on your mailing list, or, or I think they might want to be on the mailing list, or whatever, I add a they don't. They're not on the OACC list, but they're but they go into the column of what I call the OACC possibles, and so probably when you became a regular member and were added to the OACC announce group that Steve's uh, the media blend handles, I probably still left you in mind. So I send. Out, sometimes I'll make the. Um, sometimes I'll say make sure for the one that go for the message that goes out to the members, be sure to bring along a friend or whatever. I'll say something along those lines. For the one that goes out to everybody else, because I send it twice, the possibles, I may put a note down there that says, membership is 20 bucks a year, you don't need to hear that, and your first meeting is free. So sometimes, when I'm not so busy at night, I'll go ahead and make them slightly, the message is slightly different. But you're probably still in the possibles list, I'll check that. It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> okay. I see everybody sitting around like that. Well, we can definitely cut, bait, cut and paste back and forth. That's not a problem. But to, to, to release it out of the Excel format, I'm sure there's a way of doing it. And I'll, when I get a chance, I'll do a Google search on it. If, you know, I'm sure there's a way of doing it. At least, at least it, you can turn off all the grid line crap when it's not selected. Then uh, you, can, you can also turn this off. I could have exported it that way, and I didn't. That help? <laughs> there's got to be a way of doing it. There always is. Apple. Apple supports almost every practical way of doing stuff. Okay, what else? What else can we everybody, talk about? Everybody else is fine? I can't believe it. Well, should we talk about... Uh, uh, yes, sir. I ran into a problem with the hours and hours and hours installed. Uh, I, I had to download the program, and along with it came something I didn't ask. It's called Mac what? Of all evil shit. It turns out it was an application. There are other things that came along with it. Okay. But back then, it disappeared as an application, so I couldn't remove it until I went to another look at the basic hard drive. I talked about Clean my Mac? No, no, no. That uh, the one that has the little man's face. Um, um, uh, I was always telling people, hard to get rid of it. Um, Mac Keeper. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mac Keeper. Okay. Now, the funny thing is, I'm hearing both sides of the thing. 
some people say, well, it's okay now, you know, all that stuff. But before, I mean, it takes control in, of your computer if there's any little piece left over. When you're on Safari and you're closing windows and stuff, bingo, at the last window, there it is. Oh, clean your Mac with Mac Keeper and all that stuff. I've never heard anything good about Mac Keeper. Yeah, I haven't either. Look at to me when you're when you're checking out sites that you shouldn't be checking out, and there's an ad for Matt Keeper in there. That ought to be a good indicator right there. That ain't a good site to be at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so you're running like Mavericks or Yosemite, you're running one of those operating systems? Yeah. And it comes up from the upper that's, right. a, that's a notification, and up there in the upper right most corner, you can see it, you can also get to it through system preferences. And um, let's go to system preferences. Yeah, I think you can I think you can set the I know you can on the phone. I think you have the option to, to change the, the timing on it. Apparently not. So I mean, right now, here's all the stuff that I've got, um, and you can see I can I can choose what I want it to be. Calendar, it's just an alert because I, and it tells you down here what it's going to do. Yeah. So if I change calendar to a banner, it appears in the upper right corner and goes away automatically, where an alert stays on the screen until I dismiss it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, wh whatever you're the getting, it, works. pardon? For the calendar, it works. For, okay, so which one are you getting it for? Okay, so it, you can, each each thing. But you got to do that in Safari, though, don't you? In, in the browser. I don't use because I don't see anything. Sure well, here we go. There is a if you're using Safari, there is a selection for Safari. Do you want it to be a banner? There you go. The, uh, by default, it's banner, so it shows up there for a few seconds and disappears. Mm -hmm. If you change it to alert, select Safari and change it to alert. Whatever was sending that message out to Fox News or whatever, that will stay on the screen until you manually go click it. Okay. Well, it says, oh, okay, yeah, alerts. Be Wait. alert. We need more alerts. It's an old joke. Oh, God, that one is <laughs> so see, I have I have things like the calendar, and Facebook and FaceTime. I think I've got those all set. I don't care about mail. Mail is mail is none because I got we get so much junk mail showing up there, and I leave mail open all the time. But like in the case of uh, FaceTime, it's a banner. I mean, I don't need to see if I change it to an alert. I'm going to have a message on the screen. So if I've been gone for an hour or two and come back, I can say, oh, well, my sister uh, tried to FaceTime me from Hawaii. But I also have, since I have FaceTime in the dock, I'll see a little badge symbol on the FaceTime that somebody tried to get a hold of me that way. So totally customizable. You can either have it show up or not show up or only show up for a fraction of a second. But you need to go into System Preferences Notification and select the one that you want to make a change to. Does that make sense? I know I talk fast. I was vaccinated with a phonograph needle. Yeah, right. Nothing else. Hey, you know, sorry. Relative to all these problems with the pop ups on the screen and so on, uh, I don't want to necessarily turn them all off. Is there something I keep getting? Is there some way to turn just specific ones off and you don't get them again? What are they from, Quirky? Oh, different places, different people, different But companies. they're all coming in through email? No, they're popping up on the screen when I'm doing something. Depends what application they're attached to. What you do, Clark, is... You, like I said, you saw me making the adjustment. Sorry, Steve. You yeah. saw me making the adjustment for banners. That affects all banners that come through, that, yeah. all notifications for Safari. No, that's why I'm asking. Someone turns specific ones off. No. So you never get them again. Turn them all off. Oh, okay. Well, what OS are you running for? Huh? What version of the OS are you running? 10.4? Yeah. Don't they have pigeons coming to you with little notes <laughs> attached to their legs? Um, if you take a, a screenshot of it, oh, help. command shift uh, three, four, four, oh, four allows you to.
window. We have selected, but the thing is, is we want to see what you're running at the same time. So to get that to us, and then we'll analyze it. Any of you that have a problem, you know, we, Craig and I have never turned people away. Uh, we're trying to help. We're not trying to help them. We can contact us directly also. Okay. Can we move on to... Well, there is a practice. I've, I've read a lot of stuff about why that naming convention. Think of it this way. Remember they did it with leopard and the next version came out with snow leopard. Yeah. And they did it with lion and the next version that came out was mountain lion. Right. In both cases, the secondary use of the name seemed to imply that it was an improved version of what they had. So lion or mountain lion was a, uh, an improved version of lion. And snow leopard was an improved version of of leopard. So the belief is that El Capitan, since it's part of the Yosemite National Park, is an improved version well, of Yosemite. Isn't that that's Half Dome. Oh, that's Half Dome. So if they bring out another improved version, it'll probably be called Half Dome or something like that. That's but great. That means you're half upgraded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Half Dome, you lost half of Yes, sir. Could you take a picture and import it to your iPhoto and show us what it looks like on my phone? Oh, you mean a picture with the phone? Just a picture of anything. Sure. So, uh, a, a screen snapshot or a picture of the group or what? It doesn't matter. Just, I just want to see when you take it and put it into iPhoto and then what iPhoto looks like and, and how it shows up on. I want to see what, what you have on your computer. Oops, not what I wanted. Let's go, let's go back to just a. I'll take a screen snapshot. How's that? In fact, I'll take a partial one. Here's a command shift four, and we'll do just just that chunk as well. So now you see by default I haven't go to the desktop because they they're visible right there, and now I'm going to select those two and do a right mouse click and share to. Uh, I haven't bothered to update that. Nope, it doesn't have it in the share sheet. So we'll open it, we'll do it from photos. There they are, there's the last import and there's those two images. Okay. I, I, okay. Or whatever, and I drop it into iPhoto. Okay. Uh, that's what I like you to do. Oh. So I could see that, and then see your iPhoto, and see, see how it all goes together. It seems like anymore it's a, it's a hassle. So let's get a photo that's probably not in there. Uh, I want the library. What's this? Oh, it's new. That's good. Hey, what the hell? She, she's hidden, right? This is on a cover of a magazine, so it shouldn't be too bad. <laughs> Jennifer Aniston. No, that's not good. Yes, it is. I know my near naked women. <laughs> okay, so I, I've got a couple of ways. I can either go to iPhoto and import it, but I can also drag it to the if the if the application is open, it just does it. If the application is not open, here we are. Yeah. So you can many times you don't have to open the application separate from Does that make sense? The uh, thing I can you want to I work can either on. I can either go to mm -hmm. iPhoto up here to file and import mm -hmm. and navigate to wherever there it is right there, pick eleven, because I haven't bothered to give it an intelligent name. Okay. When I do it that way, it, get, it brings up the review for import so that I can, I can keep it or not keep it. See, it's recognizing that it already exists. Okay. Oh, one other thing. Yeah, you mentioned, or everybody mentioned to me, 
but I can also drag it directly to Photos. And if Photos isn't open, it will open Photos. If you just, if you just click on iPhoto now and open it up, what do you see? Oh, okay. Let's click that and do it. Okay, in this particular case, it remembered the last thing I had open was the last import, the last thing I imported, so it defaulted to open up that. If I have it set to, do I have anything here, time lapse? Yeah, okay. So let's quit iPhoto here. I think it'll open up into time, I think it opens up into the last environment you're in. Yep. How many times did you buy? <laughs> uh, only if she came with it. Um, one other thing we were uh, Did talking that answer your about question? Sorry. was um, basically Command Shift Four. We were talking about selecting. Very helpful. Just a plain old window, right? You know, not that. Um, <laughs> no, I know. I know. Go, go open one of your hard drives. <laughs> okay. Now, instead of having um, a screen that shows both windows. Do uh, do this. Press the space bar. Oops, hang on. Click fiddling. No, no, no. Close that. Now, Command Shift Four. Oh, I, rather than okay, you see the see the first off, you see the numbers there. Yeah, now they're changing. Those are the X, Y coordinates on the screen. That's what those are. So I, I have the option when I'm in Command Shift 4 to either window around that. But if I've got multiple windows, I can hit the space bar and toggle. Oh, it's not doing. There we go. It Boy, that person's persistent. Bar, it should lock. Boy, this person's persistent. Man, tough. It only does it on the active window. There we go. So you can see it's it's toggling back and forth. as I move the little camera around, I can take an entire snapshot of the background only, of this window only, even though that one's partially blocking it, or this window. So if I if I click there, my new screenshot right here is of that empty window. Even though it has Something okay, blocking it, because it. it is. Think of it as a layer. So the background, the, the desktop, for all practical purposes, is a layer. How so did you get that camera up there? Okay, so I do a Command Shift Four, which would normally be the coordinates, right? And I'd window around whatever I wanted. But if I hit the space bar, it changes to the camera, oh. and now depending on where I move the camera. And then you click. So like if I click down here, it's going to get even though that window's hidden. It's going to take a picture of that window. That's using which OS? Oh, for the last five or six. Okay, because mine didn't do that. What version are you running? 10.5.8. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. It does. I get the camera on three, but I do the on four. Okay, and then hit the space bar. Do, do command shift four, hit space bar, and it should change the camp. Oh, they moved. Well, maybe they moved it, but I would always had that ability, apparently. Whenever they had the windowing capability, they added that layer functionality as well. So, yes, sir. Uh, I have um, Yosemite, and I lost iPhoto, which I like, and I don't like Photo. Uh, how do I get it back? How do I get iPhoto back? You got an answer, Frank? I to talk about that, and the thing to do is. Uh, but since you've already done that, if you've imported your stuff into the new photo, you can't. It, it's not reversible. Yeah, it is. Oh, it is. It is, um, because it doesn't. It doesn't actually import it. It just builds a new XML mm -hmm. file that that contains the the pertinent information for photos. From what so, I've read about it, that's what people have been running into is that they have they can't go back and get their photos. But you can still no. run iPhoto in Yosemite. Yeah, and it'll, you can, I don't think you'll be able to do it in El Capitan, but when it comes out, I don't know. I don't think I've got iPhoto on here anymore. It might. I don't yeah, know. I, I do. I haven't tested it in El Capitan. 
Well, but I still have photo, iPhoto on here. We'll find out. Which library do you want to open? I have the latest version of iPhoto. And when I, I try to bring up the latest version, it won't let me. Well, the red button's always quit. Quit the window or quit the pro. Because it, because you only have a single window. That's why. There's only a single. I couldn't tell you, Stuart. I can sort of understand it if it's if that's the entire file. It doesn't do it in iTunes. In fact, sometimes you got to go up and you got to come down and scroll down to iTunes. That's still a little sloppy from that standpoint. Well, there are certain programs that will quit with hitting the red button on the window. Like if you go into system preferences yeah. and, and you close it, you know, that will. Yeah, it's always been my understanding, Frank, if it supports multiple windows within the program, then it just quits the window. Right, right. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Because you can close it, your windows in Safari, and Safari will still be open. Yes. If there was some. iPhoto being one, um, <laughs> probably, yeah, and probably uh, uh, iTunes, because it doesn't have separate windows. Oops. Who knows? Who knows? I had too many keys here. Yeah, it really doesn't like that. There we go. I'm just too in. I'm too eager. Thank God you can do that, and it usually doesn't do any major damage. Shall we try to take a look at uh, yeah. at the new stuff? Maybe we'll get to go home. <laughs> you don't find me scintillating? I don't find me scintillating. Yeah, won't that be confusing? I love it how Microsoft is capitalizing on 10. They bypassed Windows 9 completely. They never had, and they went directly to 10. And they do it with an X. And it is free. Yeah, it is. You're right. It's only free, though, to people that have had 7 or 8. It's not free to people who have, like, XP. They have to pay the $130. So, which essentially met Apple was that way too when yeah. they made that change way back when. Yeah, they, you know, that was really an important step for them to do was to make it so that it's free to those people. You know, that Not free to corporate. Corporate still has to pay the corporate price if they want to buy a whole bunch of licenses of Windows 10. Wow. It's only for individuals. Yeah. But that's the important part. Well, it's like, you know, Let's hope this works with this. It's only free for the first year. Is that what it is, Frank? Yeah, because after uh, July 29th next year, you have to pay for it. So long for you have to do it within this year period. They're probably just trying to. I mean, Apple makes a big thing of how many people migrated to Yosemite yeah. and to you know to all the various versions. I think that's probably why they're doing that is to is to be able to say and four billion people switched over to Windows 10. You know. Yeah, well, I'm yeah, sure it's going to be an advertising thing. That's yeah, kind of work. How about that? You can be doing something on your computer and it will initiate that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
working on a new version of, of um, Yosemite or whatever. It, this, it should be, but it doesn't look like it, it is. It is, but I in, uh, interesting. I had a different image set. It's picked. It's picked this up. I had made one up specifically that had El Capitan in the way. Not this one. That's theirs. But we'll use that because it's here. Yeah, I sent a I sent a bug report on El Capitan to Apple because the MRT, which is it's the uh, the back program that runs in the background, it's the uh, the malware program. What malware. doesn't work. No, it doesn't. They have it disabled, and it keeps spamming in console. I, all it does every ten seconds, I get a spam in console. <laughs> and I sent him a bug on it, but I haven't heard back from him or if they've done anything. He did it in both uh, beta two and beta three. This is beta three. That just came out this week, I think, yeah. as I recall. Yeah, I, so I, 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 I did beta update two, that. And then I updated the beta three because I I had to be using it. Like um, okay, so let me get my, my notes out here. They said, Greg said, um, in an article somebody had that um, the corporate, is, you know, corporate people are very slow, being very slow to go to 10. Uh, Windows 10. Yes, Windows 10. And that's understandable, Steve. We're at Windows 7. We finally, our company just finally made the decision in my group that if you, because we have a lot of PC based tools, I'm not talking like Acrobat and Photoshop stuff, we have that, but that right. doesn't fall in. I'm talking about CAD design stuff. Uh, if you want to put it on a laptop that's a Windows XP, it's at your responsibility. If it don't work, that's your problem. Yes. We're not, our group's not going to help you at all. If you're not on at least Windows 7, we're not going to help you. We just, we just had to cut it off somewhere along the line because. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, these are people who have company laptops, first off. But some of them are just, well, yeah, I really don't like the new Windows. <laughs> Tough luck. We just can't, they just can't uh, support you for the rest of their life. Can't do it. Have to move forward. So I can sort of understand that, Steve. It, it will be, I mean, my company is, by default, if I order, if I order a new desktop machine today, it would be Windows 7, which I think was better than Windows 8, personally. It will probably be a year. Well, since there's no incentive for a company to do it financially, uh, it will probably be at least a year before Broadcom makes the decision to, to start putting uh, images of Windows 10 on machines. They know Windows 7, they know the hang-ups for it or whatever it is, so they'll stay with Windows 7 for the time being, I'm sure. There's an article in the latest Mac Rumors newsletter. It says, IBM Corporate Office Windows 7 Really? Well, for one thing, there IBM's gotten very aggressive about starting to build iPhone apps. Yeah, they're working with that. Yeah, they're working. So I mean, you know, isn't that weird? What goes around comes around. It comes back eventually, you know. Okay, so I mean, we sort of talked about faces. I don't think we're gonna, we're or, uh, about uh, photos. I don't think we're gonna see anything really, really different. Uh, well, I know we won't because this hasn't really changed. So this is this is booted up to a different drive, so you're not going to see the same uh, uh, setup as the way it was before. What right here? Yeah. No, that's the kitchen. That's the kitchen. Oh boy. Marsh and I are having a slight disagreement about who should be doing what. Uh, oh my God. Paper plates. Looks like somebody's not doing it. <laughs> well, I mean, I spent a weekend, one weekend, do, damn near doing all the dishes. It took me like six hours to do them all by hand. Oh God. And immediately, I mean, and she's off. She's been retired for two years now. And it's like the next day I come home and they're just piled in the sink. And I'm at the point now, I don't give a rat's ass. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get home at 5 o'clock and if, if I know for a fact that she's upstairs asleep, I'll go get in the car and drive down and get something at a fast food restaurant or whatever. And she come, she'll get up at 7, 30, 8 o'clock. You want to have dinner? I'm going to bed in 30 minutes. No. <laughs> So we have some slight disagreement. I mean, we don't have, we're not throwing stuff at each other, but we have some slight disagreements about what's going on about that right now. I don't mind doing my share. I'm not going to do your share also. Sorry. So every now and then I get mad enough I walk through and I take pictures of stuff. Uh, <laughs> and, and, then, and then you uh, show it to your uh, club 
you're seeing the subtle part. <laughs> well, yeah, but when I'm eye chatting with you, I see. Oh, you see the junk on the table behind you, sure. Behind you, you have a folded laundry. And you must do that. Yeah, you know what? I, I think that we're beyond that stage. I think the housekeeper would be scared to death to come in. <laughs> My nephew was getting married a week from today. He works at a uh, uh, Indian casino up in uh, the Seattle Olympia area, and I guess Trace Atkins. I think that's who that is. So he he's the AV guy up there for that casino. So he gets to meet all the people that perform there. So he's got a pretty good, pretty cool job. He's getting married next week. So at the moment, there are no uh, real new features in uh, Photos because they haven't updated the version that's in the OS X beta right now. In fact, interesting enough, uh, Apple actually sent out, I don't know whether anybody see, seen that in uh, Apple News, uh, if you're running either iOS 9 beta or uh, El Capitan beta, you can't review stuff, which I think is right. Because people would have something like, I'll, I'll just pick like uh, 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 Fanatical, which I use on both the iPhone and uh, the Mac uh, for our cal a calendaring program. I like that as a front end to uh, uh, the calendar program. Uh, if, I, if, I'm running, if I was running iOS 9 and Fanatical is working, and all of a sudden I think, hey, there's a problem with it, it won't let me go and bitch about it on their website, on the uh, Apple's website that other people could see because I'm running a beta operating system. And you know what? That makes sense. It's not fair to the software developers out there to take a hit on something they haven't had a chance to update yet. So this is the first time that Apple's done this, and it's been kind of lauded by a lot of the Mac fanatics out there. In the past, if you were running a beta of anything, you could go bitch about a particular third-party app not working properly and have everybody read about that. That wasn't fair. It's only not working in your combination. You're not running legitimately signed software. So they've taken that feature away until the product becomes a, a bot, until the operating systems become viable. Well, you know what? That's other, the way it should be. What the other thing, Greg, that I, I miss um, is when Apple's working on a new, I, a new OS, was before that most of the stuff um, from other companies would come out and it would be ready to go when the new uh, OS came out. Well, now Apple, from what I can figure, is that they're um, releasing it, then releasing it to the developers like Adobe and some of the other ones. But they get it still a lot earlier than what the public does. Yeah. They still get it earlier, Steve. Yeah. So chances are within a, within a week or so after... A, a, Everything will well, work. You know what, what Nobody recommend. How many times have you said this? Don't be on the bleeding edge. Yeah, I am. I'm always on the bleeding edge because I don't yeah. care. I have I have this stuff being backed up nine. You know, I mean, on this particular solid state one terabyte drive, there's two five. There's two 450 gig partitions. One's got an exact clone of what I did just two days ago on uh, Yosemite, a full clone. So in case something went wrong, I always have that. I would do that. I've learned the hard way now. I always do that. And the other one's got a full copy with. Uh, El Capitan loaded on, which is what I'm booted to right now. And so, worst case scenario, yeah, I'll go ahead and upgrade, but I'll probably clone it over onto the solid state drive before I make the upgrade. So if I find three or four days later that was a problem, I can go back. So. Well, I had a deal. I had uh, bought a uh, 240 gig SSD, and I put it in. I bought a deal, a little fixture that goes in place of my optical drive and took out the optical drive, put that there, so now I've got two drives, uh, look like three, but one's the... Uh, partitioned. Our partition. Um, and so Mark, Mark says to me, well, what are you going to do with that thing, you know, and all that stuff? He's saying, well, gee, Dad, the only computer you've got that you can run Yosemite on is this. And so I said, oh, We'll put Yosemite on it. That's what I'm on right now. But I can go back to 10.6.8, which is what I. Well, there's instructions too. I mean, I, I I thought about putting it on a separate drive, but I said, you know what? I want to see how how it's going to be in real life. So I'll I'll make a clone of my operating system the way it is right now and put 10 put 10.11 on that and mm -hmm. see how it seems to work with everything. Um, 
but there's but several of the websites, including iMore, give detailed instructions on how to do a disk partition through disk utility of your existing operating system and maybe make yourself like a 30 or a 40 gig partition just to load the new OS onto to play with if you want to do that. Yeah. So that's kind of nice. It's nice that Apple has that ability to be able to do that. And uh, Mark's been checking out the internet. By the way, Mark's my son. Um, and what he's found is he found something that uh, you can put, because we have, we both have the exact same 2006 uh, Mac Pro tower. And unfortunately, Apple in their wisdom, it's a 64-bit machine, but it's not included to be able to run Yosemite. And so, um, so what happens is he found there's a place, someone has developed a EMT or EMI or something um, that handles the booting. And oh, yeah, it's EFI. EFI. EFI, yeah. And um, I forget what the acronym means. Electronic firm integration, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Basically, it's, it's the replacement for BIOS. It's right? the application that that basically does the conversion between your actual motherboard and the machine language and the operating. Okay. That's that's what it's for. Okay. And so uh, he found that he wanted to try this. I said, here, here's a, a you know, 500 gig hard drive. Go, you know, knock stuff out. And he's been able to boot it. Yeah. On uh, on his Mac Pro. Yeah, but that, there, yeah, I was just going to mention that there is, there is a little, you know, with all the hacking cautious out there, that's where that was born. Yeah. Cool. You know, it, you even take the old Power Macs, you know, I'm running 10 4 on my old 8600. <laughs> These are just funny images that people people send to me. I over here in the corner. <laughs> got an HP Hackintosh Center Sun Center. Yeah, well, I've got you know I got my hack. I brought mine in a couple. Of yeah, I have time. one. I have one that a friend of mine gave me because he was getting frustrated with it. Maybe I should have <laughs> let my son at that and see if he can make it work. You know, because uh, the reason I got it was he said he couldn't get. Um, uh, Wi-Fi to work. You know, well, the, 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 you need to find out what Wi-Fi cards that that, that built into that machine because there's certain ones that don't support support it. Oh. So I've, got, I've got a Wi-Fi card in my uh, my Hackintosh tower at home. Apple doesn't recognize. It. Well, this is a notebook, which really no. But I'm I'm just saying even the notebook. No, but you can get a third-party Wi-Fi like what we've shown in the past, Steve. You know, oh, like yeah, when you plug it in. Yeah. And Get a USB and yeah. toggle and plug it in. And have it done. No, there are certain ones. Right. It's just the way the picture was taken. I just <laughs> I, somebody sent these to me, and I just thought they were so damn funny that yeah. <laughs> yeah. it looks like the dog's walking on water. I mean, it's it's actually a partition, a hidden partition, small Macintosh or Apple computers running OS 10 has. Recognize her from uh, NCIS and Betty White. Oh, is that uh, Polly? Polly correct? Has certain files yeah. That she, Betty, uh, Betty White. Yeah, Betty White. But, but that's amazing because I am so used to seeing her with all the tattoos. Well, not so much that, but neck thing and the, the hair different. Well, she's supposed to be goth. She's at least got the black fingernails. Your your electric bill must be horrendous. <laughs> no, because they're not all so dark. Oh. No, the air conditioner is what you So, Greg, what are the new features? Oh. Oh. There's really no. There's really at the at this point in time there is no changes to photos. The new photos, when it's officially released, will have the ability to take third-party filters, and maybe open with external editor. Nobody knows for sure, but the belief is, yeah, they'll be able to. You'll be able to designate like Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever you want. So that when you want, when you want uh, uh, something a little bit extra, you'll be able to come down here. Right now, you'd have to go to a short chair, and you can't even do that at the moment. You can't even do that. But the belief is it'll have that option. 
when it comes when it gets finally released. So photos is pretty much the way it is right now. Okay, my phone keeps turning out, and I keep. Uh, I don't know how many problem people have had this issue, especially if you're working on multiple screens. But how many times have you you can't find your cursor, so you move it around until you? This is a new feature. Come on, yeah, not doing it. There we go. Saw how it got bigger there. If you just move it up and down a little bit. Come on, there we go. It gets giant for a fraction of a second so that you can figure out where the hell it's at. I find myself moving from one side, clicking, 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 until I get it over there, unless I make it giant myself. So Sometimes it actually disappears. That's true. It can actually disappear. But if you've got two screens set up, that's really easy to do, because it could be, not in between, but it could be enough of it hanging. I mean, let's face it, you can slide it down here, and all you see is that, is that well, I've got it set up to where it uh, blacks out. But if I slide it down to one of these corners, um, <coughs> you, see, you can just barely see a dot there. I can tell that it's down there because I have my menu bar on the right here because my screen's wider than it is top and bottom. I'd rather have the, the, the screen height, so I've always got it there. But that's a new feature that they've got. Um, one of the new things they're going to have, I don't know whether this version of Notes supports it or not. But Notes is going to have the ability to, besides just be able to put text in, which it can right now, you'll be able to put voice recordings, music, songs, photos, video, screen snapshots, anything inside of Notes. And it'll be available on your iPad and iPhone that way as well. Well, this, this whole thing is going to be integrated so that everything is open. Well, the whole, intention, the whole intention of the Notes is right now when you want to move something from your Mac to your iPad or iPhone, it's kind of a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you can use AirDrop. That's one way of doing it. But uh, what a convenience to just be able to use. I mean, a lot of people are using Dropbox. I was using Dropbox or Evernote, uh, which supported a lot more things because Notes pretty much was just text only before. And now it's going to be able to support literally anything that Adobe, excuse me, anything that you'd be able to just drag and drop. It looks to me like Notes is going to be able to support that. So that'll be a real useful feature as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Spotlight. The new spotlight that's, that's out now has bugged the living daylights out of me. And why am I not getting this larger? There we go. <laughs> Took a while. Watch this. It's actually movable again. That has bugged me so much because it always was in the way of everything. And unless you're working with two screens. Uh, so now you'll be able to move it out of the way if you want to keep it up for any length of time. And it's adjustable in size. Look at that. I can make it bigger. So they should have had that in the, la in the current version. And who knows, maybe they'll offer a bug fix or something like that. It's not a bug. So, but this will, since, since they don't charge for these operating systems anymore, that's kind of nice. Well, what does fruit juice do? Mm. Fruit juice is um, a battery uh, utility. Boy, does it work slick, too. Um, Adrian turned me on to that. I was real bad about, um, that, because this is plugged in and running 24 hours a day, I was bad about never exercising the battery. So fruit juice is a scheduled reminder. It'll come up, there'll be a banner on the screen that'll say, you should exercise, it's been 632 days or whatever since you've last ran this on battery power. It'll tell you to go ahead, well, I'll show you. It'll tell you to go ahead and disconnect give it a moment here and it'll come up and it'll say okay now disconnect your battery and it'll start running stuff at maximum power or whatever to try to drain the battery down to about 10 percent and it'll warn you at the 40 percent at the 10 30 percent the 20 percent you'll get a banner pop up that'll tell and then finally it'll say better plug it in now better plug it in now so it's basically a, a battery exerciser and that was uh, um, Adrian that turned me on I think it's 10 bucks but uh, since I, in, in previous laptops, I killed the batteries, when you could change them, it wasn't such a big deal. But since these are all integrated in the newer ones, you can't really get to them. So that's a really useful utility as far as I'm concerned. There'll be a Find My Friends widget, a, a standalone application of some sort that you can put in there, sort of like the one that's on the iPad and the iPhone. 
which doesn't really exist right now, you can sort of do it klutzy wise through messages if they're on your, uh, if they're listed in your uh, messages uh, buddies. Um, but it'll be it'll be much more flexible when they come out. There'll be a standalone thing just be able for people that have allowed you to do that. I mean, I think Steve's the only one that's bought it to say, sure, go ahead on my find my friends that I put in. I think you did way back when. I don't know way if I, if when, I, I don't still got it current or not. Yeah. So that's something you can choose to turn on or turn off if somebody puts a request in. Right. But like as an example, um, my friend's wife, she has an iPhone. He's got an Android. And they were running late. We didn't know whether they were with it. And I said, you know, I think she's got find my friend turned on on her, on her phone. So I wanted to find my friends, chose her name. Sure as hell, a map pops up and it shows me how far away they are from where I am. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's, a, that's a neat little utility, especially when you're expecting somebody. But, but a lot of people are paranoid about it tracking Craig, you. you cannot believe how many. I was at my uh, cousin's house uh, a while back. She has two daughters, uh, twins actually. And um, I take and I say, oh, well, Victoria, let me check and see where she is tonight. And they say, you, you, you're stopping your daughter? I said, no, I just gotta make sure that she's home and she's safe. Because uh, she's uh, living at a dog rescue right now. And uh, I find it very helpful, like Diane's on her way home from a client in, um, what is it? Uh, Burbank, and I says, oh dear, don't try and go through downtown. You know, you're gonna have to take the, this way or that way uh, to get home. And I find that to be a good feature, you know, because I can see where she is, I can see where she's headed, or I know where she's headed, and uh, let her know, hey, watch out for this. So it works, for, it works quite well. How much is it? It's free. Find my friends, it's free. It's on the iPad, the iPhone, and it will be in uh, El Capitan. This is supposed. Go ahead, sorry. Pardon? Uh, there might be an Android utility that does that, but there's nothing built into Android Google. that I'm aware of. Google has, Google has something like that? Well, I mean, more and more stuff is getting that way because people don't like the idea of being tracked all the time. I, you know, my feeling is when when I first got married and we, and we got a new phone when we got together and all that kind of baloney, my wife's. My wife didn't want to have an unlisted number. I said, why? The people you don't want calling you are the ones that can get the numbers. You know, back then you paid to be unlisted. So I'd rather, ha I'd rather just be listed as Gregory Locke, and maybe nine out of ten times they'll get the right Gregory Locke. You know, I mean, I remember way back when the comedian Gallagher said, why do we have phone numbers? Why don't we just dial the person's name? It may be the wrong person, but at least you got the right name. <laughs> some stupidity logic to some of that. They're supposed, this is, um, oh, I don't have that turned on, that's why. This is supposed to be, um, now, there we go. Greg, so, why is that showing up as um, question marks? Where? On the screen. You had question marks where there should be pictures. Because I didn't have, those are HTML images that would be normally when you would see them on the screen here. They would come down as uh, here. Here's a good example, like this. I didn't have any kind of an internet connection on this operating system, oh, oh, oh. and I because at home I'm using cable. And Apple, in their infinite wisdom, when you've got both cable and Wi-Fi, defaults to Wi-Fi. Yeah. I haven't figured that out yet. At the 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 latest version of UVerse that I've got at home, the cable is so much faster than the Wi-Fi. And I haven't bothered to set my Wi-Fi back up yet. For my wife, I really don't care because she's just reading emails and looking at yeah. websites and recipes and stuff. But for doing any of the video stuff, it's so much more efficient to do it with a cable. Since, since I've already laid a cable down, I might as well use the cable. I bought myself, of course, now Apple's come out with a new environment, but I bought myself one of these uh, 
little boxes that plugs in through a Thunderbolt port and it gives you Ethernet and Firewire 800 and three USBs and you know, it's got all that garbage across the box back so now I only have one cable to take the Mac loose from uh, that mess so what do they call it an expansion board or what a hub yeah so that's made that a lot more convenient so I don't know if you were back in the Apple II days right no uh, they had a deal where they had seven uh, seven slots one I forgot what one was the two was your printer three was your 80 column cars stuff like that but people wanted more so some company made a external case for you to plug in more cards and it's tied to the computer i remember that oh. I, I, they, they made that for uh for, for max as well yeah. it, you had the six slots the uh, gpib bus got back then yeah. or the what do they call it the, yeah and Several companies made these expansion chassis where you could pl plug in all the because they were trying to get into that high end graphics market. Um, there's a way, maybe you remember, Stuart, there's a way of doing tabs now in mail, but I don't know how to do it. I tabs? Tabs. Or? So that you can be looking at multiple mails at the same time, which is kind of a nice little feature. Oh. And now, where you would normally have, like, now you can save multiple drafts of files so that you can copy stuff back and forth between uh, files rather than copy close this one, reopen this one, paste it, copy, close this one, reopen this one, paste it. Now you'll be able to have multiple drafts windows open at the same time. There's a deal thing where you can take and, um, like say Jib Jab, say you had um, five emails from it, uh, you can turn on in preferences. Where it stacks them up? Where it keeps them all, all together. together. Yeah, I have that by default turned on. Yeah, that's kind of... So that's a handy feature. So like... Yeah. Um, I probably don't have oh, one on here. I mean, a lot of you know that I have a, uh, I have a um, uh, micro SD card plugged into my Mac that I think is 128 gig, and and my photos is right right now it's about 35 gig in in my uh, photo library. Mm -hmm. um, although I'm going to start scanning, I've got about 100,000 slides, not all of them. I'm going to selectively start scanning those but I want to save it the maximum resolution. So one of the um, one of the things I have, I figured that slot was being never used. So in fact, let me hide this for the time being. In fact, you can see it right there, this micro SD2. So yeah, what is this, 120, 128 gig. So I have a carbon copy cloner every night at 1 a.m. backing up my photos library and a couple other things to that card. So I've always got it with me. So no matter what I trash, because I lost my photos once and it took me days to recover them from multiple, thank God carbonite, I use carbonite. So I was able to get most of them back off of carbonite and I got a lot of them off of other drives that I had. I thought, you know what, that slot's just sitting there dead all the time. I'm not using it. So I went out and bought one of the little cards to cram inside there from Costco, it was like 60 bucks. And uh, every night at 1 p.m. or 1 a.m., carbon copy cloner, that's why you see the CCC safety net thing there. Uh, backs up that and a few other things onto that built-in, onto that uh, plugged-in card right there. Oh, one of those things. Yep. So I've always got a backup copy with me no matter what. So so that's what that, that's what that do. Can you go down your, your um, dock and just tell us what some of these icons are like that you don't recognize starting at the bottom that little red that's if you're a creative cloud uh oh, member Adobe. yeah that that's telling me that there's something to update uh, so that's what the, you see this one up here sometimes i turn that off so it's showing that there's a update of some sort to these five applications that i haven't bothered to do yet on this on this operating system yeah. Yes. And, okay, and it's searching Adobe for the library. Yes. Okay. So, but even if I'm disconnected, everything still works. It gives you a grace period of 30 days or whatever it is, just like Apple Music does. So, you know, if you've got the streaming, if you bought, well, right now it's free, but if you decide to buy into the $10 a month streaming Apple Music thing, you can either stream the music or you can download the music. So, like, if you're in a, if 
you're streaming, you're, you may be using cellular data, so you may be picking up the hit on that if you're streaming your music. But if, as an example, I've only got one, uh, I've got one um, George Strait album, Texas singer, right? One country album. Let's say, as an example, I, and it's, it's, it's the one that's all my Texas, all my exes live in Texas, that one, that album there. And so if I wanted to listen to all of his albums, I can stream them. But if I decide, you know, album one and four, I really like those two. I'd like to have them available all the time. I can choose to download that and be inside my Apple library. Right. And all Apple does is just check month to month to make sure I'm still currently paid. But well, what about Adobe's app? Same, same thing. It works the same way. It just, I'm not 100% sure that if I stopped today, uh, whether they would turn it off or I just wouldn't get updates. I'm not 100% sure what the deal is on that. Yeah. But I know for a fact I don't have to be connected to get it to work. Okay. So I would never uh, go with a service that I had to be 100% connected all the time. I avoided that completely. Because, you know, I, I was into camping. I may be back into camping on my own soon but because uh, my wife doesn't want to go anymore. But um, I want to make sure that I can use everything that I've got no matter what. Yes, sir? Well, it's old. Hopefully, it'll still work, uh, and it's FireWire-based, so I'll have to come. I'll have to do the cabling, Mickey Mouse, you know, from 400 to 800. But I've got an old Minolta slide scanner I bought about five, six years ago that, roughly, the sizes are about 28 megapiece. Uh, 20, yeah, 28, uh, yeah, about 28 megapiece, something like that, yeah, at full resolution. One of the things I like about it is it's got a. Um, it came with a, a film script reader, and its slide scanner I can do ones or I can do five. So I can preload it up with five slides, make sure they're all you know as dust free as possible, and it'll do slide to slide to slide to slide. It's automated. I'm sure they got a newer version, but I'll give that a shot before I go spend any more money. Well, but now you can buy a decent slide scanner for under 100 bucks anymore. I went and uh, saw over at Costco one time a Kodak T whatever the number is, and it was basically there was the thing. I don't know if anybody remembers the Dijonier paper port was a deal you could sit on top of your monitor, your tube type monitor where there was enough space, and you could take a piece of paper and feed it in an F11, and it would run it through and scan it and bring it out the top. And that thing was fantastic. I bought one for each of us in the house, mm -hmm. and uh, then they went away or uh, you know they stopped supporting the software. But this Kodak thing was, $89 and it would scan a full piece of paper in color or you can take and there's a little little fixture that you go to the left side and you plug it in and it switches it over to uh, going from positive to negative to convert them, to import them as positive to your, um, to a folder and then you've got to migrate them into iPhoto. But um, the thing where it's really slick, and I don't know about the, the <coughs> resolutions on it and stuff, but uh, heck, I just want to clear out all my old stuff you know, that I've got on, on uh, uh, negatives. And, um, and now I found some slides, and it's like, I just, you know, you, it's the old deal when, when you were young, you want collect everything, you want to have everything. And now as you get older, it's like, I don't, I don't want this, it's too much stuff, you know, and boxes and boxes of negatives. <laughs> I mean, I talked to people about this before that um, I no longer print anything. I mean, I do all, we do 99% of our banking through the web, yeah. through B of A. And, and um, whenever I pay a bill, I'm just paranoid enough to, to I never write the confirmation number down. So I'm paranoid enough to know that, because I've had a fight with them a couple of times with a couple of people that they have to send the bill to them because these people don't have any kind of an electronic system set up. Mm -hmm. uh, RV storage is an example. And so I've just gotten in the habit um, to print everything, but I'll save it as a PDF. And so it'll be um, Amex, 
space space, the dollar amount in the file name, space space, and my six digit date coding, which Corky hates, my six digit date coding. And the only reason that I do it that way, and I'll show you exactly, And the reason I do it that way is because I don't have to actually open the file up to see what it is. So you see right there, there's an American Express payment I made that was $565 yeah. on June 23rd, 2015. Well, that's, that's interesting. I, I've just gotten in the habit of naming these things this way um, so that I can read the file name and I can sort all the American Express stuff if I just click on name. Right. I can sort them all and I can see what I paid at what month and I never have to open the damn PDF I can. I can always hit the space bar and go look at it if I want to. Oh, that, but funny. to me, this is a lot simpler than printing crap and keeping rec paper record. Yeah. Right. Plus, it's searchable. So the nice thing is if, I, if I'm if i looking for something that I've saved as a receipt because it's an intelligent PDF, I can search for uh, something, really Costco, so I can search on Costco if I wanted to and it would find it. I can't do that on paper unless I rescan it back in. So. I don't use a printer hardly for anything anymore. Well, I pay, can say I pay a bill and, online, and uh, Diane brings me every month uh, the seventh and the eighth. We have two Amex payments, uh, two different cards, and um, so what I'll do is I will do a screenshot of the last page that has the confirmation and everything. But the damn thing is, they send it to me in the email. Can you turn that preference off? What's that? You should be able to turn that uh, turn that off to, to not send you the paper records if you don't want them. No, no, the email. And they email me, you know, you we have processed a charge. Oh, I see what you're saying. You know, well, you can throw that away or keep that in a folder. I would, well, I would probably, I have a folder in my mail called Receipts. Yeah. And some of that's broken out into more if it's going to be anything that I might make taxable or tax deductible or whatever it is. And in the receipts category, there's subscriptions and books, there's iTunes and Amazon, there's, you know, on down the line like that. So yeah, but I, I like this better because, see, I do um, A, AE Blue, AE Costco, and AE Platinum. Okay. And um, so it works out real well, but I like this with the with the amount on it. Again, since that's part of the, I do that again, Steve, so I don't have to actually open the file and look for it. Right, right. I mean, you know, it's it, I mean, we've got 128 characters we can have in that file name. I might as well use it to, yeah. so that it sorts based on what it is. And even though it's Costco, I used to put Amex. Costco, most of the time, I just put Amex anymore. Well, I and that'll change soon because Costco's throwing out Amex. Yeah, I crazy. They obviously can't negotiate a better deal like yeah, they have yeah. But the thing is, is I do AEC, AEB, and I know what it is. But um, I like to be able to put my numbers. Yeah, I find that that works real good. And what I should do probably is break is breaking into months and you know and, and, or into years and put the 2014 and the two I who cares <laughs> they'll all they'll well, all well, sort whatever I, I got it what do I care you know it's there uh, something that ends with 08 or 09 but uh, but you can see that's why I use that naming convention because I can see it right away it's June 6th or it's June the 12th 2009 yeah that's easier for, I've gotten used to reading it that way so I do it that way well whatever works for you that's what counts I'm sorry, say that again? Yeah, but I don't use Quicken. Yeah. I have in the past, and it's a fine program, but no, I don't no, find no, myself... What is this, uh, what program well, it's I go to B of A's website for their online banking, and one of the options is after you've made the transaction, they give you a confirmation number there. I click on their option to print it, because they have an option built right in to print it. So when it brings up the print dialog box, I go over here to print this PDF, and then that brings up the dialog box. Where do I want to save it? Well, I've got a folder called Bill Page, you know, because that's what Apple, that's what Bank of America calls it. So it almost always remembers I was in Bill Page. So I just change the name. I've already had the amount copied or pasted in or whatever. Select that, 
paste it in and put it to date date. The date that I pay it doesn't mean the date it gets it actually gets transferred, but that's the date the paperwork was generated from by side. So I find that that dumb old pack method works pretty good for me. And I don't have to print a lot of extra. I got a lot. As you can tell by the pictures of my house, I got enough of junk laying around. So. So anyway, mail is supposed to. Do I still have that open? Mail is supposed to offer better. Um, I haven't really been using any of the apps in the full screen mode, and I'll probably force myself to start doing that because uh, I'm the old hang around guy from the old days or whatever. Well, Greg, you know the thing that drives me nuts is I'm with a customer and we're trying to work on something, and every time the screen opens all the way. And then I have to go down to the corner and shrink it a bit so I can see the desktop. Yeah. You know, this this makes it very difficult. Yeah, and uh, there'll be an advan there'll be a way to get around that here. Let me bring something else up. Oh, do I have Creative Cloud open? Yeah, it'll work. I think. So split screen is it split. You can, you can actually tap your That's true, which I do that all the time. But this will be brand new. Whoops, come on. Not wrong. You know, if you read dates and ask it to uh, make the calendar event calendar. Now look at this. No available windows. Because this is, this is not, not supported yet. So let me get something open that is. I'm sorry, what did you say? I said that um, it also, in many cases, if you read uh, dates, you know, um, email coming to you, and ask it to make the calendar event calendar. There's split screen view. It's taken me a little while to get used to that. And you can change the split. You can actually. Oh, this may not let me do it. I, I read somewhere that depending on how you get your split set up over here, it may or may not let you do what you do that. So let me turn that off. Oh yeah, that's kind of cool. See that? Yeah. That's brand new with mail. Yeah. Uh, uh, so see, see that little option right there? It was smart enough to realize you put a date and time in there, so you want something. So I can I can either delete that or I can click add, mm -hmm. and it'll add a, it just added it to my calendar. Yeah. That's handy. But as I was mentioning here, here is split screen, and I know it's a little weird as far as what you can and can't split depends on whether it already has column view set up or whatever. It's kind of limited by that, and who knows whether they'll change it. But so this allows you to actually both programs are they they were still running before, but but if you don't need the whole screen and you want to rather than to click and make this one active, it's just a question of doing such and such like that. And you can adjust the split again depending on the application, whether it'll let you shrink it down so, so not completely, and whether they'll offer more than than a dual split for somebody who's got a really big screen. This, this could be really useful. Oh, is that right? Now that I wasn't aware of. You have to do what? I haven't tried it. I don't know. But they say you can't adjust the distance between the two splits. It apparently looks like it only works in with applications that are full screen at the moment. Now maybe I'm wrong on that. <laughs> I haven't quite gotten the hang of this yet, so, but I think it's going to be really useful down the road. I, I know they have more of an issue with that than they do on Macintosh, on Apple phones, that's for sure. Really? 
Yeah, but we know that's going to go away probably within the next year. Adobe, Adobe has yet to admit it, but everybody and their brother is dumping flash right and left now. See, my, Steve Jobs knew what he was talking about way back when. My son sent me an article last night about that, talking about uh, the difference between Android and, I, and OS, <coughs> iOS. And it's very, very interesting because they're always complaining about this is what's going to happen with iOS, but yet it hasn't happened yet, but all the stuff they're saying that's going to happen to iOS has already happened to the Android. And there, there's it's actually a broken system. Anybody who has an Android, you're, you're basically, you're, you're really not protected. Hmm, anyway. interesting. This article really went into the, the nuts and bolts of what was going on with it. I can't, I can't remember the address, but maybe I'll, I'll put it on the uh, Oh, you see this? Okay. One of the new things they're adding, uh, it already exists in uh, mail for the iPad and the iPhone, is swipe left and right. So if that's taken me some really getting used to it because I had that feature. But you know, you can see right away I can swipe to the left to trash that. So that's a little quicker than have, having to select it and going up here and hitting the trash can. That's kind of nice. And then I can swipe to the right to mark it as unread. So it, but it, it does need to be a swipe. You can't do it with a mouse. So if you've got one of the magic mice that's got the uh, swipe surface on it or if you've got the trackpad, you can do it that way. But you, can't, but you can't move the mouse back and forth. I don't think they figured out how to be able to do that one yet. But since this magic mouse has that swiping feature built into it, I'm sure somebody will come up with it. I'm sure somebody will figure it out, yeah. So that's kind of handy. So the, the, the big th things there in mail are the, uh, the auto add event and calendar and, uh, and contacts, which I really like. The tabs, which I haven't been able to figure out how to get to work yet, and I haven't found something. Multiple drafts and the better, their better full screen integration, which of course, that's gonna, especially for people with laptops, that'll probably be uh, more and more commonplace. Um, I already mentioned the swipes option, which is gonna be available in everything that Apple so far has figured out can handle swipes. So that'll be a commonplace thing. And split screen, which we just saw. Uh, there's an improved mission control. Oh, I just turned my light off here. It's a little dark up here. So this is done a little bit better. Now where you had, I never was a person for using uh, spaces. I, I, I don't know, it always seemed like a really good idea. And I just, I think I came from the old days where you never had enough memory so that you used a program and you got out of it. So yeah, if I'm working in both Photoshop and Illustrator, chances are I wouldn't have had mail open and I wouldn't have had iTunes open or whatever. But I got 16 gigs of RAM on here, so it's not like it's a real problem. It's just carryover from my old legacy days of when you didn't have it. Well, now they've got now they've got a lot of options here. Let's open up a couple more things. And when I hit the Mission Control button, you see those options. You can see Desktop, and you can see Safari. And if I move into the mouse program, I can come up here and and add uh, other ones if I want to in there, which is kind of handy. Extra Desktop by just clicking on the plus. And if I want to make something unique to just a particular desktop, I can, just like so. And I can switch between desktops. So. <laughs> I think that's going to become uh, commonplace uh, for the so-called power users. If you just hit the short key like that, you get the abbreviation. When you move the cursor up there, you see what it actually is. And one of the things you can do is let's get back up here. Is I can move stuff between. I can move stuff between different desktops, just as easy as that. So if I click on this, come on, bring it back up here. And I want to put that over on this desk, uh, on the same one with uh, <coughs> safaris and reminders open. Oops, sorry, wrong piece. So on that one on my old version that I've got. What old version? No. Uh, no. <laughs> Electric cars wouldn't run on your day either. <laughs> Actually, they were invented before gas engines were, so it's kind of a. It only took a century, but you know it's kind of coming around, but. Who knows? Maybe that'll come back. You never know. There used to be an application called Multiple Desktop, remember? Well, there, th that exists from other people. And Apple's had the, the quote, desktop spaces for a long time. They've had it for about four operating systems now. I just never really used it. I just never found it. I mean, to me, it made sense. 
to maybe have one for desktop publishing and for doing financials. I just never did enough of, of any one thing or enough things at the same time that I found a use for it. And it's possible because they've come up with a cleaner way, I mean, you still got that, uh, they've come up with a cleaner way of doing this that that might be, might be worthwhile, I don't know. Uh, time will tell whether that becomes practical or not. I don't know for me. I keep losing my phone. I probably should have left that on all the time. Um, yeah, you can drag a window into spaces bar. That's true. Uh, one of the things they've added is what they call metal for Mac. Some of you may be familiar that Apple has been pushing for years the op OpenGL the Open Language Graphics Accelerator, uh, which Apple pretty much invented it and kind of gave the technology away and nobody really supported it. And then they also have OpenCL, the Open Common Language, I, I think that's what that means, doesn't it? I forget exactly what the CL stood for, to be honest with you. But the last three or four years on the PC world and somewhat a little bit on the Linux world, more and more companies have been using Metal, which is another graphics uh, utility or whatever it is, El Capitan will have metal support built into it. They claim in a lot of applications it's going to accelerate up to 40% more than what you're presently getting. I'll take whatever I can get from a speed standpoint. What the hell? We, we're always going to be bitching that there's never enough speed. So I'll take it. Whatever's available, I'll take it. So that'll be new in El Capitan metal support. And it'll take a while for some of the applications to upgrade to that, to, to have that capability built into it. But I'm sure we'll see that come out. Also, you probably don't notice it, but there is a new system font. For the last couple, of, for the last four or five years, it's been a version of Helvetica in a way. And now they've come out with a font that's been around forever and a day, but they pre, kind of rebranded it, that they call San Francisco. And the big claim to fame is, is the letters will actually change based on the screen resolution that you're using or what it's being what it's being used for. So for smaller letters, uh, they'll be slightly more bold, easier to read at small sizes, but as they get bigger, they'll automatically adjust to be more legible. They're supposed, for normal menu stuff like here, it's supposed to be a little cleaner and a little uh, easier to uh, distinguish gaps between like the letters, the, the letting space between them. Uh, eh, who knows? Time will tell whether that's useful. Use, you'll still be able to probably hack it with an updated Tinker tool and change it to whatever font you want to. But I, they've slowly been integrating those fonts into, into the iOS 9. We'll have that newer font in it. Be a little easier on the smaller displays. And uh, this will have it. So whether that pays off in the long run looks to me like it will because it's pretty subtle. Okay, a lot of people have been asking on the websites, how do I know if the OS 10 El Capitan will run on my Mac? Well, the safe bet is if you've been able to run Mavericks or Yosemite, you'll be able to run El Capitan. But Apple is saying, and this is their definitive answer, doesn't mean it's going to be true. If you have an iMac from a, and it was, and it's purchased and its release date was mid 2000 or 2007 or later, so that's going back eight years or so, you'll be able to run El Capitan. A MacBook Air, the late version of MacBook Air, 2008 or later, MacBook itself late 2008, the aluminum or the early 2009 or newer. Mac Minis, Mac Minis 2009 or newer. MacBook Pros mid to late 2007 or newer. Mac Pro early 2008 or newer. And if you, anybody who's got an Xer, <laughs> I only know two people in my life that have ever had those, 2009 and later. So, or, and newer, excuse me, rephrase that. So, for the, for the most of, the, for the bulk of us, we can probably run El Capitan. And especially if you're already running Mavericks or uh, Yosemite, you shouldn't have an issue. Um, officially, nobody has set an official release date. The trend seems to be about mid-October. That's what they've done the last three years. So that's the assumption, is about mid-October for uh, El Capitan. For iOS devices, the belief is probably about the second week of, Jan of uh, September, Apple will have a conference talking about, we don't know if it's going to be called this, the chances are it will be called the 6S and the 6S Plus. 
uh, updates to the phones, maybe a new camera. Uh, definitely iOS 9, they'll be talking about that. Um, definitely split screen on iPads. On the iPad, I don't know how far back it'll go. Split screens go back on the iPads. I know the movie option will only go back to iPad Air 2. So who knows? Nobody knows for sure on that. Um, that you'll be able to run two applications side by side rather than have to necessarily toggle back and forth. How far back that'll go, we don't know. Um, again, the newer font to be able to read that a little bit better and, and, and support for metal. Um, like I said, I was going to put that on a on my iPad and I just plain ran out of time. So I'll plan on putting that on my iPad, a beta of that for next month, anybody who wants to see that. We also have for next month, we have Allison Sheridan from Nozilla Cast. Nozilla is Allison spelled backwards. I love that. Uh, she does a podcast every Sunday. She's been on uh, Tech TV a few times with Leo Laporte's group. She does a two-hour podcast every Sunday, her and Steve, her husband. They've been, she's been here a couple of times uh, talking about things. And she's going to come out and talk about her version, simplified version of password management. You've heard Roberts in the past, and we've all talked about one pass and uh, and uh, uh, last pass. Uh, I use one pass, which I really like. Uh, but she's got a method that she says is a is a winner as well. Especially if you don't want to spend any money. I always like ideas like that. So she's going to come out and be our speaker for next month. So we're open to questions and answers. Right, on questions. If anybody's got anything on this while it's still up, otherwise I'll boot back into Yosemite so we can still answer anything. Uh, otherwise, it's a short day since we lost out on Robert. So anybody got anything? Stewart's the only app. What's up? Um, intermittently, I will go to a stable file. I will make something for text edit. Okay. Anywhere else, intermittently, I will go to do that, and I'll paste in what I, I want as my file name. And it will tell me it's too long. Now, I know I'm way under the limit, which is 256 characters on R, but it doesn't always happen. Only once in a great while. It's acting almost like you've got something pasted in the buffer that's that it's picking up. Exactly. I wonder if anybody's had that one before. I don't know that I've had that, but I've had it tell me um, that you had uh, too many characters or yeah, char well, characters that weren't. Yeah, certain characters aren't allowed, like percent signs. Right. You know, that kind of thing. I'm not using that. Letters and maybe an underscore or a dash. That's it. I'm just wondering if somebody's encountered that one before, too. No, but Jeff, the next time it happens, take a quick screen snapshot. Even if just a wide screen, that's good enough. Okay. Uh, yeah. and, and maybe we can see, maybe we can figure it out. Yeah. What what operating system are you on? Yosemite. You are in Yosemite, okay. It's like uh, pictures work, files and orders. Mm -hmm. It makes it really handy because unless, you know, you We have to make it reproducible. That's the problem. Exactly. Well, it's the, so the other thing, that would bug me too. Okay. Um, oh, the other thing was um, if you have iChat and you have it set up, um, and that's one thing people should get also talking about email addresses, is an AOL address. You should have, there's three that you should have as far as I'm concerned. Everybody's got messages, or anybody with the last five or six operating systems or whatever has got messages, or iChat, as the old name was. You should also have Team Viewer. It's a free download from Team Viewer. Just do a Google search on Team Viewer, 
and download the free Mac application. Just have it. It takes up hardly any space. They'll assign you a unique user ID. That's yours from here on in. Um, if we're ha and I'll tell you why we're, why I'm, I'm talking about that. TeamViewer also will allow, I don't know whether Steve uses it, but I, I use it a lot for PC and Linux users, um, will also allow me, if you give me access, it'll give me access to your computer as well. Uh, one of the things that it doesn't support right now that iChat or Messages does is voice at the same time. TeamViewer doesn't, so you almost have to be on a cell phone or whatever. Here's the way it works. If as an example, and I, I, I will choose Messages every time if I can. But messages requires that the guy who made the connection has a really good uh, bandwidth. bandwidth. It depends on the guy who, he's for all practical purposes, the host. In the case of TeamViewer or Skype, they use a central repository. So the data is going there and then going back out. So, and all you do is make the, make the initial connection to it. So once messages is, is a cleaner, better way to work and you only have to have like between me and Steve, it's never an issue because we both got enough bandwidth. It. But some people have older systems or whatever, or it does what they need. They don't need to spend the extra dough to get the extra bandwidth. So with TeamViewer, and it's available for an iPad and iPhone as well, with TeamViewer, the way it would work is, let's say you'd call me on the phone and say, Greg, I'm having such and such a problem. You got a few minutes now? Yeah, I'll take a look. If we can't get messages to work, we have a fallback. That's the advantage of it. Eventually, Skype will be there. It's not yet. Skype is only for visual and audio communication right now. Um, so with TeamViewer, if you've got a TeamViewer account, you can start up TeamViewer at your end, and every time you start up TeamViewer, your user ID shows on your screen, but, but it, it also assigns you a temporary password uh, for you to give out. So as an example, in case of Steve, if Steve says, I'm having problems, and I say, well, go ahead and start up TeamViewer, because maybe I'm having problems with messages that day or whatever. So I'll start up Team Viewer on my end, and which I don't happen to have it here right now. I'll start up Team Viewer on my end, and you can see there's my there's my uh, user ID, and it's got a password right now for this session. Okay, this partner ID right here, that's whoever the hell that was the last time I connected. I don't bother. I usually clear it because I don't bother to keep them. I don't want to. If I was talking to Steve enough, I'd make one called Steve. But all it would do is save me them six digits, them nine digits to type in it, big deal. So instead, once I've, once I've got TeamViewer running on my end, I'll ask Steve, because I, I don't keep these records, and the password's unique every time. The user ID doesn't change. Steve, what's your user ID? He'd say something like 688-134-202. That's what his user ID is. Then he'll, so I'll go ahead and, and connect to a partner, put in his nine digits. Then he'll ask me for a password. And all over the phone, I'll say to Steve, Steve, what's your password for this session? And he'll tell me 6311. So I'll put in 6311. Now it's authenticated, and it makes a connection to their server to me, and I have access to his computer. He does too. We both do. And I'll see it on the screen. The good thing is it doesn't really care too much about revs. It'll work between Linux and PCs and Macs. It doesn't care because all it's doing is just passing the screen display and the keyboard and mouse inputs. That's all it cares about. And I find that sometimes that'll work where messages or iChat, let me try to help somebody out, doesn't work. So it's a freebie, download it, don't use it unless you need to use it. And then finally Skype, because messages and iChat only works between Apple users and iPads and iPhones, just like FaceTime does. Um, Skype will work between anything, anything that supports Skype. Unfortunately, it's Microsoft, so they haven't done a really fabulous job of support. But again, Skype works the same way. The connection's made, the server is hosted at Microsoft, and the connection is just passed through at both ends. Um, so I've got, all three, I've got all three of those tools on here. The reason I like uh, TeamViewer is for fixing problems. Skype and Messages, Messages is kind of, Messages and iChat, I'll use both names, is kind of for both between Apple people only, and, and but also communication, and Skype is communication. So like, you know, everybody outside my uh, my brother and nephew, because he used to work at an Apple store, so he convinced them all to go over to Apple and get rid of their PCs, has to be done through Skype. If I want to talk to my sister uh, in Westminster or my uh, uh, wife's relatives on the east, back, back east, it has to be through Skype, because they're all in the third world. They're dealing with PC stuff. 
So, but in my in my mom's case, she got an iPad three years ago. By golly, she can play solitaire on it. She can watch Netflix. She somehow figured out how to do that using my sister's account, and she can answer a FaceTime call. But the other day, she FaceTimed my nephew, who's up in Olympia, and she doesn't know how she did it. Well, it's because that was probably the last app that she was open, and she probably touched that button. His was the last name that was on there. Boom, and he just happened to be sitting there, so he answered it. <laughs> Does she want to learn? No. She has it, so she can talk to my sister, who lives in Hawaii, and they talk nearly every day. Of course, she forgets. So the charger's in her bedroom. She leaves the iPad in the living room, so it's almost always dead. <laughs> So I tell her, you know, uh, Dad, wouldn't this be a really good idea to move the charger to where she leaves the iPad? That's too easy. That is too easy. My wife is exactly the same way. The other day she said to me, she's retired now, remember, she said, I've got a blood draw at 8 a.m. Can you do me a favor and wake me up at, when you get to work at 7, call me. Okay. Uh, the phone in the bedroom's not working because we've pretty much given up on a landline. So take your iPhone upstairs and I'll call it. Well, it won't be charged. Well, you leave it on the charger downstairs all the time. It ought to be good for a night. So take it upstairs. She did. 7 a.m. I got to work. I called her. Called her again. Went right to voicemail. That should have told me. Uh, 15 minutes later, I called her again. I figured, well, maybe the buzz will wake her up. She took the phone upstairs. She turned the ringer off. That was useful. Well, I don't like to listen to the ringer. Well, how am I going to wake you up? So, of course, she missed the doctor's appointment. <coughs> So, you know, I, she goes, well, you know, I, I said, well, what you could do, Marsh, if you want to leave the charger down here, you could carry the phone with you upstairs and bring it with you. I do, because I use it as an alarm clock also. I, I carry it with me all the time. And uh, you could do that. No, that's what my, Well, I have another charger here. You want me to put a charger upstairs, then you never go. Yeah, but if it's upstairs, then I have to run upstairs to get it. That's why I carry it with me. I do. The joys of uh, family life. Anyway, you should have all three. You should have Team Viewer, at the very least, it's a freebie. You should have Skype, that's a freebie. And you should have Messages or iChat. And set an account up on all three if you don't already have that set up. And I would just add with Team Viewer, it's very secure because every time. It's unique yeah, password every, every time. It's unique password. And that doesn't mean every day, it means every time you quit Team Viewer, you have a new password. And. I could, if I wanted to, I have to have two pieces of information from you who I'm trying to help out. I have to have the nine-digit user ID. That's unique to you. You can give it to me. It's worthless because I have to know what the password is that Team Viewer just gave you a few minutes ago. And there, because it'll change every time. Now, there is a way to set that, that you can set that up to make it the same every time to allow you to access that. So you could, theoretically, you could put Team, if you have uh, Team Viewer on your phone or your iPad, you could leave Team Viewer in a running in, in a running mode at home with the auto answer feature, and you could connect up to as long as you have internet access, whether it be through cell or whatever, you could connect up to your Mac at home anytime you wanted to if you choose to do that. I have no need for that, so I don't bother. So, but I've had a couple of people who have who have told me I don't want you to install something that they're going to be able to watch me. I can't watch you, you idiot. First off, the program has to be running. Secondly, you have to give me whatever the password is that time. And you know what? I got more important things in my life than watching what you're doing. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Was um, oh, Leo Laporte talks about it all it's from ESET. I, I forget what it's called. Their, their security block. Uh, Not 32. That's that's the PC name of it. It's, it, uh, Macintosh not 32 but it's from ESET it's 70 bucks a year or whatever it is to subscribe to it um, I have mixed feelings about uh, virus utility first of all hardly any virus has ever hit a Mac especially if you use a little due diligence and don't just download everything that you can download um, but I've gotten something on there whenever I go into Safari whenever I go into Safari besides MacKeeper on some websites um, whatever I go to, let's just pick a generic, uh, yeah, whatever that ought to work. Uh, it's a Mac Com article, that may or may not. I would see blue links like this. See right here? The next year? It looks like a link, but it's not. It's something else. 
but mine were actually underlined blue links, so they look like hyperlinks. And I click on one, and it would take me to something that I had had nothing to do with the article. And it was a piece of malware that had somehow gotten into Safari, and it managed. I have Fire, I have uh, 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 Chrome on here, and I also have uh, Firefox. So that I have an alt. You should have it. You should have an, uh, another browser just in case. And um, I would get to where it was. It was showing up on all of them. And ESET was the only one that managed to find it and keep it at bay. And the reason the reason that's even it's not doing any damage, but the reason that's showing up, I'm sure if I click on it, it's going to take me somewhere. Yeah. No big deal. It's, oh, it's taking me back to the Mac World article, so it's probably a legit link. Um, but it was driving me crazy that I was getting bugged by stuff. Didn't do any damage. It just pissed me off. And so I thought, well, you know what? Um, Adrian, who was still with us at the time before he had moved to Texas, had suggested two or three things. Nothing I did. I knew I could probably load everything by hand, not use the my data migration system because that would have brought it back over again. I knew I could do everything by hand and redo all the serial numbers and all that kind of crap. I knew I could get that and I thought, my time my time sitting on my butt watching television is more valuable than doing junk like this because <laughs> it means a lot to me anymore, especially as I'm get, getting older. I'm getting to 64 in another month. Wow. So, um, hey, hey, I'm old. Well, you're old. You're older. <clears throat> and, um, and my wife's older than both of us, so that solves that problem. And um, yeah, I just want to come home and chill out, pretty much, you know. So I thought, you know, I'll try not 32. It definitely saved my bacon way back when days when I was dealing with PCs at, at Conica Minolta. So I downloaded it. Sure as hell, I found it right away. And it would, and every time it would show up again, it would, I'd get another notification. And one of the things that it did is it would tell, 50 bucks a year, I think is what it is. One of the things it did, if I come back in the next day and Apple's got a system update, before Apple has told me they've got a system update, not uh, the Nod32 software has told me there's an operating system update. You should go for it. Yes or no? And it would take me right into the App Store. And so it's obviously working somehow in, uh, uh, in alignment with Apple to some extent. And so I just I just wish there was a way of uh, there's not there's not a convenient way of disabling it completely, short of un uninstalling it. And I I'm not a big fan of uh, apps that do that. I mean, Carbonite's just about as bad. I don't have it. I have it paused right now. But sometimes I'll go in and I'll look at Activity Tracker, and Carbonite's doing nothing, but it's averaging around 90% CPU. Well, that's 90% out of eight, uh, out of four core, four dual cores, so it's eight cores. So it's it's one, it's eating up one eighth of resources, and it's not doing anything. There are times I I think in my head I want all the power I could possibly get, so I'll go pause Carbonite, and that takes it down to like one or two percent. By default, Carbonite was smart. By default, it'll turn itself back on to normal 24 hours later. So if I'm watching a video and my vid and my resources are real short, trying to get it to Apple TV or whatever, and now it's right in the middle of a damn backup, I'll go up there and I'll pause it for 24 hours, and it'll pick up and it'll continue the backup tomorrow, this time, unless I manually go change it. ESET should have something like that. There should be a way of disabling it. Still, l let the program load. I don't care. Just don't do anything, and maybe send me a reminder. You know. Send me a reminder every two days or three days. You know, this is turned off. You want to turn it back on. When you interactively disable it, you do, but it's still got a pretty good resource on it. Uh, on this machine, it really isn't a problem. But when I'm fooling with different operating systems back and forth, I thought, that's all I need to do is have it start flagging me on something like that in the middle of a demo. So yeah. I went ahead. The only option is to uninstall it, so I always keep the installer local so I can reinstall it again. Stupid. That's just Or go into activity and manually kill all the processes. That's also stupid. There, th there should be more smarts for programs that you want to run most of the time, but you want to interactively turn them off. I mean, right now, this one here is Boom. Uh, boom amplifies the sound in the, in the Mac by itself. Uh, I can come down here and, and actually quit it. And here's uh, Fantastical, which I use on both the... I can come down here and I can quit it. Sure you want to quit? Yeah. But by default, next time I reboot, excuse me, next time I log in, it'll be back on or I can interactively start it up again. And the same thing with uh, Blotter. I use Blotter all the time. I don't use it very much. But you see there, it looks like a desktop plotter. 